Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Rick Young. I'm a producer director. I do a lot of work for many different clients, a lot in the UK, a lot in Europe, and wherever the work takes me, basically. My whole thing has always been affordable acquisition. I jumped into camera technology basically when the DV revolution happened, and I did use beta cams before then, but it was always a case of being chained to a TV station or a production facility, which is something I really wanted to get away from because you're always working to basically what's available, what they'll give you, what they'll let you do, plus the work that had to be done. And I wanted to be a filmmaker, and I didn't necessarily want people telling me what films I could make all of the time. Okay, a lot of the work I do is very quick turnaround. I work with many different camera systems. You know, like I mentioned, when I first started, it was all Betacam SP, then DigiBeta. Did a lot on DV and most of the camera formats in HD that have come through. Um, right now, we are at a crossroads in the whole production scene. We are entering the age of RAW. Now, RAW has been with us for a while, but it's becoming accessible. It's at the point where mere mortals, meaning people with not gigantic budgets, are actually able to buy into this technology. Now, the big change is the Blackmagic Cinema camera, because it's made so much possible. But obviously, this is not the only RAW camera on the market. There's the RED cameras, there's Alexa, there's the D500 from Canon, but all of those are quite expensive, and the Blackmagic Cinema camera is actually reasonable, affordable. Um, cinema has always had the best cameras, cinema has always had the top lenses, the best that money can buy, and then there's been the other cameras, and when I say the other cameras, the cameras that I've been using, you know, go back a number of years, it was all Z1s and the X1s, the X3s, the compressed formats. Now, the compressed formats are great. I've had tremendous experience with them. I've used them in all sorts of places, but they are definitely not cinema cameras. Now, if you want to get the film look, well, there's certain things you need to do, and nothing better than actually using a true cinema camera to achieve it. You may be able to fudge it to a point on some of the more affordable cameras, but basically they're limited. Now, what is good about the affordable cameras is it's quick turnaround. What's bad about them is you can't change the lenses with most of them. You may be able to put adapters on. The actual codec is compressed. As a result, you get artifacts, and the image quality is not so high. Now, you can do a lot with those, if you put your stuff up online, it might look great. If you put it on a screen that's perhaps so big, like the monitors over there, maybe it looks so, so good. You put it on a cinema screen, that's when you run into trouble. Okay, what actually defines a cinema camera? What, what makes a cinema camera you know, a cinema camera as opposed to another sort of camera. Okay, there's the format and the resolution which the camera records. Now, when we talk about the Blackmagic cinema camera, which is what I'm going to be focusing a lot today, 2.5K, that's what it records at, um, records uncompressed onto SSD. It's got a sensor. I'm not absolutely sure of the specs of the sensor, but I believe it's just a, small, just a little bit smaller than Micro Four Thirds. So that's actually a big sensor compared to what went in all the quarter inch, third inch, half inch sensors, two thirds inch before. So we've got a decent sized sensor, we've got a good resolution, we've got a great format to record to, which is the uncompressed RAW. The other thing is you must have interchangeable lenses. I mentioned that already. Um, cinema is about the look of the image. If you can't change your lenses, you can't go wide. If you can't go extremely wide, then you're not going to have the cinema look. If you can't go extremely long, you're not going to be able to do it. So it's a compromise with the more affordable cameras as to what you can actually do with them, whereas cinema has always had so much scope for what you can do with the different lenses. That's a big deal. Now, traditionally shooting for cinema, you would shoot and then it would be colour timed. Now I'm talking about the old days when it was all film. Colour timing is what we, you know, in the video world, what we call colour correction. Now, obviously, when you're filming um, for quick turnaround, you're not going to have the time to take it to the highest level. If you're filming for 
you know, cinema or for some super high-end production, then it will go through a whole production process. And I said traditionally the negative would be colour timed. The modern cinema cameras, you do your post-production of the actual image. You do that in the raw colour space and you take it into a system such as DaVinci Resolve by Blackmagic and that's where you do your colour processing. And it is a big deal. It's actually a huge deal. I've been lucky enough to have been using the Blackmagic camera for about two months. First shooting I did, excuse me, first shooting I did was all raw. It was a bit of a crisis for me because what do I actually do with the raw images? Well, fortunately, when you get the Blackmagic Cinema camera, you get DaVinci Resolve in the box. It took me a number of hours of sitting down in total confusion before it clicked. But when it did click, I was thrilled and I've been blown away since what you can actually do with that raw image. In fact, just before I got on stage, I was talking to the guys from Black Magic and I said to them that very often, once I'd got a new camera, because I'm quite busy filming pretty much every week anyway, it might take me a good two months or a little bit longer just to feel really comfortable with the camera before I actually get out and start doing serious stuff with it. Well, that's been the case with the Black Magic camera. Um, I've done a number of shoots now. It's really clicked with me what you can do with it. And it's not just the camera for shooting. It's what you can do in the post-production side of things as well. It's like the Black Magic Cinema camera. It's, it's a system. It's not, just, it's not just the camera. It's the camera. It's the lenses you choose to use with it and then it's the post-production side of things and it can't be understated just how important it is the actual processing of the images it's not like um, okay let me step back maybe a good year or two years in my thinking I remember Blackmagic they they bought DaVinci the company DaVinci Resolve was a separate product now it's all in with the whole Blackmagic organization and I thought at the time why do I need to use DaVinci Resolve? What's it going to do for me? I'm reasonably happy with what I can do in Final Cut Pro. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm reasonably happy with what I can do in my editing software in terms of correction. But I was missing out on so many of the things that Resolve offered that I wasn't aware of. It actually took a bit internally in my mind to get to grips with it. And it really came through once I started using the Blackmagic Cinema camera because the colour correction potential, I mean, people think of colour correction, and we talk about something like DaVinci Resolve, which was actually used on Avatar. Now, okay, Avatar's right up there in terms of production values, and a lot of the work I do is very quick turnaround, as I mentioned. So I'm not doing Avatar. I'm not shooting for cinema a lot of the time. But what you can do in Resolve in terms of particularly dealing with the raw images, in terms of pulling back detail, in terms of if the highlights are overexposed, bringing back the information is quite staggering. So I'm just saying, a good year or two ago, I wondered why would I need Resolve? It's well and truly clicked in my mind what I'm going to what it's good for and how I need it. Okay, my cinema camera setup. In this bag is what I've got. And I regard this as a proper cinema setup. This is not halfway there. It is actually capable of doing cinema work. The cinema look, and even though I haven't got around to stinking onto a big screen to see just how it looks, um, I think the images would hold up really well. I'm sure there'll come a time where I do get to see them. But in here I've got the Blackmagic Cinema camera and a bunch of lenses. And I'm going to show you all that in just a second. But just in the last few days, because I knew I had to do this presentation, I wanted to define to myself what is cinema quality? What does it actually mean? I mean, we all remember back in the old days, broadcast quality, Betacam SP. That was the format. And now, if you want to get on the BBC, their minimum, assuming they don't accept what you give them, is 50 megabits, 422. We all know other stuff does go through. They say it's only portions of programs, but I know that there's been other situations where it's been more. But separate to that, what on earth is cinema quality? So I rang up an editor that I know in Los Angeles. And I, I asked him the question. He goes, so what the hell is cinema quality? And this is, you know, the guy I'm asking the question. And he was actually assistant editor on two of the Mission Impossible films, on at least one of the Star Trek films, Super 8, and many other well-known movies. And this is what he said to me. Okay, cinema quality. Depends on the film and it depends on the studio. But most commonly, it's 2K on the DCP, digital cinema projector. 2K, that's what they output. He said, of course you can do it on film, shoot 35mm, put that on a projector, that's cinema quality. Um, 
he said, but most often, even when it's shot on film, it's then transferred to 2K and it's shown off 2K. But he did make the point that when you do it on film, it gives you the extra grain and texture. Um, but he said, absolutely most commonly, cinema quality is 2K these days, sometimes 4K. He said most often the 4K stuff is downscaled to 2K. You do get 4K projectors, but more than 95% of the time it's 2K. So that's it. Cinema quality is 2K. That's what you've got to have to meet that format. Now, back in the old days, it was obviously 35mm, and sometimes they show 16 or Super 16, but now it's 2K. And the Blackmagic Cinema camera shoots 2.5K raw, so we are in the realms of cinema production with this camera, which I'm just about to get out of the bag. OK. So that's it, Blackmagic Cinema Camera. It's a nice compact form. Um, I like it in the hands. I, can, I just did a shoot, which we'll have a look at some of the footage of in a minute, um, in Barcelona the other night, and I was in the metro stations, and I was in the bars and the back streets. I didn't get stopped anywhere, and I didn't get hassled. I will say I didn't quite have that lens on the camera at the time, but even so. Um, I think this is a big deal because this is cinema quality. It does let you shoot at that standard. And I've mentioned Resolve several times already, um, but you don't really get to see the benefit until you take it and Resolve and see what you can do with the images. And in my experience, there are times where what you shoot, you don't actually need to do a whole lot with. It may be exposed well. You could do a lot in terms of colour correction if you want to change the look, but sometimes it's just all right what you've shot. And the processing and Resolve for me, and I've got to say I'm pretty, you know, I'm not using Resolve at the highest level, but I certainly know enough to get the raw images in and out and also to correct them along the way, which is really the battle. I don't think it's about knowing everything, it's about knowing what you need to do. So I've been able to work with Resolve and sometimes, like I said, you don't need to do a whole lot with the images. And other times, you need to do a tremendous amount. I was filming, like I said, in the metro of Barcelona I was filming in, you know, bars that you wouldn't dare to point a camera, in, not just from fear of getting a hit, but they're just so dark. I mean, really, you could barely see anything. And that footage I'll bring up in just a minute, we'll have a look at. But on the way for monitor vector scope, I mean, it was barely hitting 15%, you know, and I mean, you go all the way to 100, and maybe if it's low light, you don't want to peak above 70. But I'm filming in situations that were totally dark almost, and yet I was able to pull back a lot. So it's a big deal. Now, we talked about cinema cameras, I talked about what you need above 2K. Um, by the way, the feature film editor did make the point to me that I spoke to. Um, he said you want to give yourself headroom, so ideally, you know, if you shoot at 4K, you downscale to 2K. If you shoot at 2.5K, downscale to 2K. It, it gives you that manoeuvrability to actually work with those images um, beyond the native resolution. So if you just shot at 2K, there's no room to push in and out of the image, there's no room for reframing without actually losing quality. So the fact that you shooting above 2K, that's a big deal because you've got that headroom. Okay, so I need to talk to you about lenses. Um, the lenses I use, and I did actually write in my notes, um, so what lenses do you need to actually work with with this camera? I can tell you what I need, the important lenses that actually give me the full range to cover. Okay, first one, in no particular order, I just said the first one because the first one I picked up. That's the Canon 8 to 15 mil. Now, you've got to keep in mind when you work with this camera, because of the sensor size, you've got a 2.3 crop factor. What that means relative to 35 mil photography, it's a 2.3 times crop factor. So if you're shooting with an 8 mil lens in 35 mil, it's extreme telephoto. If you put on this camera, you're actually shooting at 18 and a half. And I've actually written down the actual numbers so I get them right. Okay, so the 8 to 15 will give you 18 and a half to 34.5, which is a nice short wide zoom. Very good. 
Um, I've got this lens as well, which is the Canon 16 to 35 2.8. Um, I rely pretty heavily on zooms because I'm running around. It's just me. I don't have assistance. Don't get me wrong. Prime lenses are great. I love prime lenses, but it's hard because you you know you've got to reframe according to how big your room is. Step back and forward. Whereas if you've got the zooms, you can be very manoeuvrable. This one, 16 to 35, that would be wide in 35 mil terms, but in terms of the Blackmagic Cinema camera with the 2.3 times crop conversion, it gives you in 35 terms, 37 to 80. So it's a brilliant interview lens, it's a brilliant general lens. I mean, I can go out with just that lens and pretty much get what I need. Obviously, I'd rather have more. Um, I got a fixed 50 here, I got another 28. Um, this is a really nice lens, that's a 100mm macro. Um, 2.3 will be 230mm prime, but wonderful for close-up work. So if you're photographing jewellery or food or, I don't know, the lips of a model, people's eyes, anything, you can get nice and close. Um, 28 to 70, these are all L lenses, Canon's best glass. You can tell I like the zooms because they do what I need. Um, so it's a whole selection of lenses and it really gives me the means to do what I need to. So 28 to 70, that one is 65 to 160 in 35 terms. The one on the camera, 70 to 200, this I absolutely love. I can't speak, you know, more highly than I'm doing now about how good this lens is. It comes in two versions. You can buy it with the IS, which is about 1,500 quid, or you can buy it without the IS image stabilization, and it's about 850 pounds. If you read on the forums, everyone says you've got to go for the one with image stabilisation. I looked at it and thought, it's 40% more. I'm, you know, n virtually none of my lenses have IS and I'm happy with them already. So I saved almost half the price of the lens and I got that one and I love it. And what I particularly love on this camera is that 7200 equals 160 to 460. Now, obviously those are just numbers, but if you've done 35mm photography, you know what it means. Um, but it's fantastic. People have spoken about the 2.3 crop factor as if it can be a difficult thing. Like, you know, all your lenses become long, it's hard to go wide. Well, it's not hard to go wide, you just need the right lens, the 8 to 15. And like I said, that'll give you 18.5 to 34. But the advantage is 2.3 crop factor. When you're shooting on a lens that would be 70 to 200 and you get up to 460 mil on it, that can be absolutely fantastic for wildlife photography, for filming people when they don't, you don't want them to know you're filming them. And I do a lot of conferences and a lot of highlight videos and a lot of stuff on location. And even if I'm sent to film people for a specific reason, they get put off when you start you know, getting too close to them with the camera. So shooting on 460 mil is fantastic. And if that's not enough, one of my all-time favorite lenses, this one. Okay, that's the Canon 100 to 400. That will take you up to 960. Now, that is absolutely tremendous. And I actually, for some bizarre reason, quite like to film the moon. I don't think it means I'm a lunatic, but um, I've, I've filmed the moon under different situations. And you need to get to about 2,000 mil to get that moon filling the frame. So, okay, we're at 960 already on that one. By 1 1.6 times converted, that'll bring you between 1,500 and you know, 2,000, by the two times converting you're virtually 2,000. And obviously not just for the moon, but just for whatever I want to film. But it, it's stunning what you can do. And in talking about the cinema look, I mean, you need the lenses. If you don't have the lenses, in cinema, that's half the thing. Okay, they've got the nice big piece of film or the nice big sensor, but it's what you do with the lenses that makes the look. Of course, there's the texture and there's all the other things and the wonderful lighting that they do because, you know, they've got all the resources. But you know, a lot of what I do, I can get stunning looking results and I see the difference between shooting like I'm filming at the back with an EX-1 right now, which is a fantastic camera, I use it all the time for lots of things, different situations, but usually when you need to document something, like someone speaking on stage, you don't necessarily need the cinema look. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to point a cinema camera and just see how nice it does look. But um, different cameras for different purposes. And there's no way on an EX-1 or an EX-3 that I can achieve the results I can get out of something like this. Okay, now, I've been talking for however long. I know I've got 45 minutes, so I don't want to go too far over. Let's have a look at some footage. So if we can s switch over to my laptop. Brilliant, okay, Final Cut 10. 
I'm not saying any of these are absolutely fantastic. It's just a bunch of stuff I shot. All shot on the Black Magic Cinema camera. That one shot in London. Obviously, you know where that is. Um, th the point I'm trying to make with this, okay, that's the wide lens. That's the 8mm, which is 18.5. I'm just trying to give you an idea of, one, what the pictures look like out of the camera, because I think they're quite spectacular, and what you can do with the different lenses. And I've used, maybe I haven't used every single lens I've been showing you there. Okay, we're in Australia now. Um, but you know, like that one, that was shot on the, I think that was shot on the 100 to 400, that was probably 100 to 400 again, maybe 70 to 200, but it, it just gives you an idea of what can be done with the different lenses, and I love the look of the pictures, I think they're, of, of all the cameras I've used, I think they're the most filmic looking images, there's just a quality about them that looks very filmic, and every single camera has its own personality and the own texture that comes through depending what the sensor is and the format. Um, all of this was pretty much shot raw and processed in Resolve. Um, my skills in Resolve are quite basic. I, okay, now we're on to ProRes footage. Just for the test, I decided to shoot a bunch of stuff as ProRes, again, using all my lenses. And ProRes is absolutely fantastic. You can get the most beautiful looking images. But the real, and I don't want to say downside because it's the wrong word, but the limitation of ProRes compared to RAW is that you're not going to be able to do as much with your images in post-production. Um, I did make the point before that sometimes you will shoot in RAW and it will be extremely low light and you can pull so much detail out of the blacks or it might be the other way around that it looks a bit overexposed but the information is still there and you can pull it out of the whites. But um, I, I mean this was when I had the camera for two days. Um, I was in Australia and I just tested it out. Okay, well that's that 8 to 15 mil lens on there. And it is a bit barrelly the look it gives you but it's also the way to go wide with this camera and it's pretty much the only option with this camera. Okay, so that's... Um, something on lenses, there you go, another, okay, going from the wide to the long lenses. I like the tones, I think in terms of tones and definition the camera really excels. Okay, now, I've spoken to you about my Canon lenses, now this is something that's not hugely known out there, but I've been experimenting with it and having a great time. Um, just before I move forward on the point I'm about to make, at IBC, Blackmagic did announce the Blackmagic Cinema Camera MFT, Micro Four Thirds, and speaking to a lot of the guys from Blackmagic, they, they said to me that if you want to start changing your lenses away from the EF system, Canon, you probably want to go for the Micro Four Thirds because you can get adapters and you can put Nikon lenses on, PL lenses, you know, all sorts of different lenses. Well, I've been doing a fair bit of work out there, just testing at this stage with Nikon lenses on the Blackmagic Cinema camera which has the EF mount. So, I've shown you my collection of um, Canon lenses. I've also got some fantastic Nikon lenses and I love these. Okay, 50mm 1.2. That's what I should have had in Barcelona the other night when I was filming. Um, okay, again the same crop factor applies to 2.3. Got this one, which is a, a zoom, quite a long zoom, 18 to 200. That's not a fast lens, but it's still very useful for a lot of situations. Okay, 17 to 35, which is some of Nikon's best glass. Absolutely love it. And this one, which is Nikon's equivalent to the Canon 80 to 400, that's the Nikon um, 100 to 400, and I love that lens. It's not fast, but it gives you so much ability to push in on, on the images that you're filming. You can get spectacular results. And again, up to like 960 mil in 35 mil terms. So, just to prove the usefulness of these Nikon lenses, hang on, I've got one more as well, which is, okay, that's the 80 to 200, which is a 2.8 lens. And, you know, you do need the fast lenses for a lot of situations. So, I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of glass there. Um, but, you know, that's just me. Okay, let me show you some of the stuff shot on the Nikon lenses, just to show it can be done and you can get really nice results. It's only about a minute of footage. Okay, this was shot in Australia. Now, 
these birds were wonderful subjects. They let me film them, they didn't fly away. And um, I actually got probably within about 20 feet of them. So that's shooting like 960 mil on a Nikon lens on the Blackmagic cinema camera. And again, you know, I mean, getting that close, that much detail, and the beautiful shallow depth of field behind, that's what you get when you start changing your lenses. So it's the big deal is that we're able to get access to such a wonderful range of lenses whereas traditionally on affordable cameras we couldn't even change the lens so you want to get the filmic look to me that's the way to go and it is so sharp and so beautiful now i mean why would you want to use nikon lenses when there's such a wonderful array of canon glass out there well you may already have nikon lenses you may be someone that um absolutely just loves the look that you get from the nikon glass and there's a lot of people out there they you know they, as far as they're convinced Nikon is it, and that's where it begins and ends. I was the other way, actually. For years, I was telling everyone how wonderful the Canon glass is, and I thought, in my you know, being totally naive, I actually thought that Nikon was wonderful in the 60s and 70s. And then in the very late 80s, which is when I got into the Canon glass, when they went to the EOS system, electronic optical system, um, I thought... Canon was it. Nikon was just something that still existed. Until um, one of my other cameras, which is a PMW F3, I could use the Canon lenses on it, but it was difficult because I needed a separate box to actually control the aperture. Whereas these Nikon lenses I have actually have an aperture ring on them. So I tried some of them. I was blown away with the quality. And before I knew it, I'd actually spent a lot of money on Nikon glass, doubled up on so much of um, the actual lenses that I have. But you know what? It's worth it because of the quality and what you can actually do with them. And my opinion of the Nikon lenses has totally changed. Nikon is a major, major force. Absolutely fantastic. Um, every bit as good as Canon. Some say Nikon is better. Some say Canon is better. So it just depends who you speak to and um, what they think. But how do you get those Nikon lenses onto the Blackmagic Cinema camera? Okay, these adapters I ordered from the US, they cost me $10 each. I'm not recommending that you spend $10 on your adapters. I'm sure you can get something better out there. But I had these, I had them from, you know, I probably ordered these six months ago, well before I had this camera. Um, and, and they work fine. So, if I take a Nikon lens, this one, which is 17 to 35, absolutely fantastic lens. Okay. There we go. So that changes the Nikon lens into an EF lens. Now it doesn't really, I mean you don't have the electronic control that you would with an EF lens, but just that bit of it, the end of it. So it's got the Canon mount on it. So, off with the Canon lens, on with the Nikon lens, and I'm now ready to shoot. And the wonderful thing is I've now got the aperture ring to work with on the lens as well. So th this is something that hasn't been widely talked about, is actually using Nikon glass on the Blackmagic Cinema camera, other than people, you know, looking at the fact that the MFT model will be coming and they'll be able to use adapters to get it on there. Well, here you can do it with very affordable adapters. Now, Novaflex do make an adapter and it sells for, I think it's 130 or 140 pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's better than my 10 pound adapter. And I'm not suggesting that this is the way to go, but like I said, it's what I, it's what I um, already had on the shelf, so I use it. Um, I did speak to some people in one of the camera shops and they said, under no circumstances use cheap adapters, even though I've already been doing it. I didn't mention that to the person. He said he knew one person that had to use a hacksaw to get it off. Another person couldn't get the lens off and had to be sent in. I, I, I don't know if those stories are true, um, but what I've been experiencing is nothing but success. But if I was going to seriously do it, I probably would spend a bit more money. Okay, so we have a system here. We have a cinema camera. Shoots at 2.5K, which is cinema quality. Shoots RAW, which gives you tremendous processing potential. And it takes a wonderful array of lenses. So we're pretty much there on the road to producing not just cinematic looking images, but in images that are suitable for cinema. So they're actually at the right level of quality that you could do it. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're going to shoot, you know, the next 
Batman movie that you would do it on the Black Magic Cinema camera, you'd probably use something more expensive because you've actually got the budget and the means and the resources. But for you know any sort of production that you want to do for yourself, it doesn't even have to be cinema. It's if it, if you want it to be cinematic. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, shooting for cinema and getting the cinematic look, it's it's a state of mind as much as the equipment. I mean, I'm not sure that that's totally true, even though I just made the statement. But you have to think cinema. You need the equipment to do the right thing. It needs the resolution. It needs the quality. You need the lenses. You need the lighting. You need the crew. You need the actors. You need all of that. But you also need a certain mind mindset and I think obviously tape came in a long time ago when it went from film to tape but I remember hearing stories because when I started in television which was 89 you know I was very interested in what had gone before it so I spoke to a lot of people and the editors told me it was horrendous when it went from film to tape because suddenly they just got so much footage in so you've got to think about what you're doing and it used to be in the old days that sound of the clicking of the film running through the gate people used to equate that to money running through like a slot machine that's money going through and people don't think like that anymore because it's all going to card and onto hard drive and it's all very affordable well affordable is one thing but that does nothing about the quality and the result you still need to get a good result so you've got to think in the right way okay let's get on to the other side of the equation I made the point it's a system it's the camera it's the lenses and it's the post-production if you haven't got your head around the post-production the most you can do is ProRes. I mean, you need the, when I say the post-production, I'm talking about actual being able to work with the raw images. Don't get me wrong, ProRes is fantastic, but raw is out of this world in terms of what it does. Okay, um, let's switch back to my laptop, please. All right, I'm going to show you some really bad looking images and this is deliberate I want them I want you to see what came out of the camera when I shot these different scenes they're all underexposed they're all very dark and um, then I'll show you what I was able to do to them okay there we go well I'm not sure how it looks to you but it looks pretty bad from here and oh, okay well that's one I actually corrected so let me go back so if I just position myself there and switch off that track. Now I'm not in Resolve, now I'm just in Final Cut 10, but that's the image as it came out of the camera, and that is what I was able to do to it. Now they say the camera has 13 stops of latitude. Um, I don't know how you quantify exactly what it's got, whether it's got 13 or 10 or 14, but you know, I believe the statistics they give, the figures they give, simply because I see the results. Now. Okay, once again, a very underexposed image, and that's what I was able to do with it. Now, that's all very yellowy, and I'd probably like to pull some of the yellow out of it, and you can do that in Resolve as well. When you're shooting RAW, the two things you have control over is exposure and um, the colour temperature. Now, don't get me wrong, you can do a lot more than that, but on a very basic level, those are the two things that you can well and truly work with. Okay, that's the graded shot. Let's see what the original looked like. There we go. I mean, look how bad that is. I, I, this is the big deal about the camera. It's, well, I mean, there's a lot of big deals about the camera. Being able to change the lenses, being able to shoot at 2.5K, but being able to process it from that to that. I mean, on no camera that I've used. I mean, I may have pushed that a little bit too far. I don't know. That was just shot in the London Aquarium. You walk in, you got a camera that doesn't look much bigger than you know, any camera that someone will be come carrying around, and you're shooting at cinema quality with the ability to treat those images. Okay, what else have I got here? Okay, this one's probably not as dramatic, but it still makes the point, underexposed, and what I was able to do to it. And again, oops. Okay, again, not so dramatic. Okay, oops. What's going on here? Oh, I thought it was black behind it, but it's not. That actually is the image. It, I got the lights on me. I look at it, I just saw a black screen. So that's what I have, which is not very much. You can't really see a great deal in there. And I was able to do that to it, which is quite a big difference. And my favourite one, the one which to me really shows the story. 
okay. It's just a short shot. But there is actually a shot there, believe it or not. And I'm quite sure I'm playing, even though I can't see. Okay, there we go. So I was able to turn something which was really nothing. I mean, I don't know if you can see anything there. I can't see it from here. Okay, I can just see a tiny bit of detail. And then that's what it becomes. So this is why I said when Black Magic acquired Da Vinci Resolve, I thought, why do I need it? I'm not producing something like Avatar. Yes, I'm sure it's a wonderful color correction, but what do I specifically need it on my late night edits where I'm locked up in a hotel room, I've been filming all day, and it's got to be shown at 9 o'clock the next morning. And yet, now I totally see why I need it. I have every reason to need it. Okay, 10 minutes before the talk is supposed to wrap up. Now, I mentioned I was filming in Barcelona the other night, and I just put this short film together, which was just more for fun than anything. Okay, filmed in Barcelona in November 2012 using the Blackmagic cinema camera. I shot it raw. All of the filming was done at 200 ASA. Um, some of it, like the last few shots I did at 800 just to have a look. Graded in DaVinci Resolve, and I used my 8 to 15, 16 to 35, 28 to 70. A lot of it was shot handheld, and it was shot at metro stations and bars, and you know, nothing was organized, and it was just shot off the cuff. So I'm not suggesting that what, I'm, uh, that what I've got here to show you is the most wonderful filmmaking you're ever gonna see, but I think it's pretty spectacular what we actually, what I was able to achieve out of it. Okay, so this is a comparison of the graded footage and the ungraded. And I have to make the point that my grading abilities are quite limited, so it's pretty much just dealing with exposure and a lot of the other stuff DaVinci Resolve could do, I still need to learn. Now, some of these first shots, you don't see a huge difference, and I mean, you can see the split screen, but there, that's a tiny little bit of difference because there was actually enough light for the exposure, so it was all right. But coming up, you will see some stuff that, at least to my mind, is quite staggering. So I was out with these guys. We were all working in Barcelona. We were filming all day at a conference. And then in the evening, we went out, and I brought the camera just to have some fun. And I used, like I said, the three different lenses. Now... To be able to film in some of these places, the camera doesn't look threatening. It's, it's like a, you look like you're someone just filming. You don't look like you've got a high-end camera there. And yet the results, what it's capable of, are quite high-end as far as I'm concerned. Okay, there was virtually no light there. You can see the original, you can see the graded. It's absolutely staggering, at least I feel, what I was able to achieve. And just wait till we get into some of the bars because um, they were just ridiculous in terms of the available light. Okay, so I'll just let it run. Thank you. Bye. Cool, man. Cool, thank you. Okay. All right, there's a bit of sound coming through. I'll switch that off. Okay, that one was shot at 800 ASA. That's 200 ASA in a bar. There was virtually nothing there. I'm staggered I was able to get an exposure, let alone get an image that looked actually quite reasonable. There is a bit of grain in there. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite flattering. I always liked grain in, you know, motion pictures, like um, the grain that you get in film and the texture you would get in film. And of all the cameras I use, this camera, it's got that texture, it's got that look. And this is seriously low light. Again, I'll repeat myself, but I was shooting at 200 ASA. And the original is just what came out of the camera. So I did what I would call a one light um, color time print. No, that's wrong, not color time. A one light print, which means you take the original, you put it on the optical printer if it was film, and they basically output um, something which you can judge your exposure and images by without it being corrected. So the original would be the one light print, which is not treated, it's just what came out of the camera and the graded is what I was able to do to it. It's quite staggering looking at all this footage because I've done three versions. I've done the original and the graded. I've done the graded and then I've done the original. And when you look at some of these shots on the original, you, you do 
realise just how much has actually been done and how unusable the footage would be. I know, he's throwing a cake on his face, but guys out, what can I say? <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was just, it, it was basically an experiment in low light tests is what this set of footage is. It was just, and, and I was really pleased to actually be able to get a reasonably coherent story out of it as well. Not that there's much of a story, but it is guys go out, they go out on the metro, walk through Barcelona, go into the bars, have some food, head back down the Ramblas. Wouldn't have been filming there if I didn't have five other cameramen around me to make sure no one stole the camera. <laughs> And we ended up taking taxis back to the hotel, got back at 1 a.m. and had to be up at, on site at 7.30, which was a killer. But I didn't mind because I got my filming done, which is what I really wanted. So I think that pretty much shows the power of RAW. Now, okay, I'm not taking it to the highest level. That shot I didn't grade at all. There was enough there just to make it work. But I think I shot that one at 800 ASA. Um, I'll make a couple of other points just while the footage runs, which is the camera is so simple to use. Um, and this is something about cinema cameras. They haven't always been amazingly complicated things. Like, um, you know, I mean, if, if you look at any of the Sony cameras, which is what I use, and this is not being critical, but they've got so much functionality on them, it's almost like a bit too much. I don't, I've had, you know, the EX1s, which I still shoot with because I get hired on a lot of jobs and that's what's needed. I don't know all the capabilities of what those cameras offer. I know a lot of it. I've been using them a long time and I've definitely got to grips with it. But there's a lot in there that, you know, I still haven't got my head around. Okay, now just to show the ungraded of the Barcelona footage, that is some of the original. That's what was shot in the bar. Now, yeah, you can see there's the image there. But, um, you know, not much of an image, but I was able to bring it back. And again, this is the graded footage without the, split without the split screen, just so you get a bit of a look at it. Okay, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to just show you a little bit more of this, and then I'm going to jump into DaVinci Resolve and show you the little bit that I do know about how to treat the images. But it's very important to understand that it's even knowing a little bit can be massive. It's, it's not about knowing every single function to resolve because no one starts off knowing everything. We all start off somewhere. So just being able to process the images and work with them and get them out. I mean, what do I still need to learn? I need to learn the tracking capabilities, which are tr tremendous. I've seen demos of what can be done and resolve with tracking. I want to learn that. I even know where the control is. I just got to find some time, sit down, and actually get my head around what goes on. I've got to learn how to mask images. I've got to be able to do secondary grades so that you can take an image which might have a hot spot. I say a hot spot, something much brighter in terms of contrast than the rest of the image, and you can balance them out because you can effectively work on different parts of the images and use masks to show this portion. There might be, I don't know, a bright fountain there. So you show the fountain at a certain exposure, and the rest you may boost beyond and then blend between. I know what Resolve can do, I just don't know how to do a lot of it. But understanding what can be done and having a starting point, which is where I am now, is a big deal. Okay, I've probably got three minutes left, and I'm a lot better at Final Cut Pro 10 than I am at Resolve. However, I kind of, maybe it's just me being a bit strange, but I quite, quite like pushing myself when I'm doing a presentation to actually see if I can show as much as I think I might know. Here we go. DaVinci Resolve, opening up. Okay. Once I'm logged in. Okay, so first thing I'll do, these are all the different projects I've got, but I'm going to create a new project. And I'll call it Barcelona Demo. Create, double click it. First thing you've got to do is set the frame rate. If you're not working on the frame rate you need, then you're in trouble. Um, so I shot everything at 25 frames a second. 25. I just put everything to 25 and then I know it's going to be fine. Okay, 25. Apply. Close that one. And then Blackmagic Cinema Report 2. This is where my Barcelona footage is. And one night in Barcelona, DNGs, pull those across. That will take all the files. Thinks about it for a minute. And then we'll get to see it. 
And at that point, I can then process the images. Okay. All right, so it's showing us the images. I will say Resolve does take a fair bit of processing power. It pretty much takes over your machine, so I try not to have anything else running. I mean, I am on a laptop that's a good year and a half or two years old, so that's probably got something to do with it. Okay, go into the color correction side of things. Okay. Now, a nice way for monitor vector scope. Let's find some of the worst shots. So, just going through the footage. Okay, that's a pretty bad looking shot. Can't see much in that. That's actually one of the shots in the bar. And you can see my scopes. There's not very much in terms of luminance in that shot at all. Um, just grab the luminance control and push it. And you can see how much I can pull out of that. Now, I would say that's my 13 stops. I don't think Black Magic are exaggerating when they say 13 stops of latitude. And not only that, if you want to go into the clip and then actually work on the color temperature, and then I'm just over 3,200, I can make it 4,000, and that will warm it up. If I make it 5,600, it will get very warm. which is more than I want. And if I make it two and a half, it'll be less than... I mean, the correct color temperature is 3200. I'm just showing, for example, what I can do with it in terms of adjusting color temperature. So, in summary, now that I'm at the end of my time... Okay, and that's even cooler. In summary, we have a cinema camera here. I believe it to be a true cinema camera. It shoots above cinema quality, 2.5K, like I said. It's only half of the equation as far as I'm concerned. DaVinci Resolve is the other half of the equation. You can use it as a non-cinema camera and use it more like a broadcast camera and shoot ProRes. It may be that the ProRes looks great on a big screen as well. I haven't tried, but what you're not going to be able to do is what I just done to those images, which is pull back all of that detail. So it's taken me a couple of months of spending time with this to totally get in my head where it fits in with what I do and how I'm going to use it. Um, and I'll just make one more point to wrap up. And I know it's a very pro camera point, but I was a live director for 12 years, ITN, BBC, Sky. I have two EX, one's an EX3 and F3. I want at least another one or two of these. There you go. Thank you very much.